Hello and welcome to a wonderful good evening at Chaos Communication Camp, not Congress, Camp 2023. It's day two, it's the evening, and this is the Millie Way stage. It's good to see you all here. Responsible disclosure has been around for a couple of years now, and it's pretty much proven to be a mechanism to find vulnerabilities, to report, uh, to report them to the affected parties, fix them, and generally to deal with it well. But there are, and we can discuss about that, also moments where this responsible disclosure does not work so well. How and why and what this has to do with Jens Spahn's Schufa score will now be explained to you by Lilith Wittmann. Please welcome her with a very, very big round of applause. Yes, thank you. We're in a hurry, as usually with my presentation, so please don't clap too much in between, otherwise I won't be able to make it in time. I know sometimes you guys think sub school and you get excited, but just not too much in between. Thank you. Right. Today we're talking about Jens Spahn's credit score, which is very good, which might not be very unexpected for anyone here. And first of all, of course, thank you to all the people who are making this possible right now today. All the angels that are kind of working here right now, we can applaud them as well. Exactly. And we have a very special guest today. The crisis PR person from Bonify is sitting here among us. He really wanted to come here and maybe tell us or whatever what a great company Bonify is. Unfortunately, he won't be able to speak here today. He did get in, but we really don't want him here telling us nonsense. He's a crisis PR person, and you can see a picture of him here from his website. He used to be a Playboy interview chef. And now he does crisis communications, but he doesn't like to call it that. And Jens, he's really, really cool. He advertises on his website with this context of special forces, like the GSG-9, the SEK, or the KSK. And he, he may have GSG-9, but I have CCC, and I have angels that take good care of him. So I'm not afraid of him being here today and uh, pushing his way in. Yes, please sit down. You're not allowed to talk. That was the agreement. So, now that we have also welcomed you, from now on you may please be quiet. And at the beginning I wanted to tell you a story today, kind of a backstory of Bonify and Schufa. Once upon a time, there was a big old credit reporting agency that had been around for close to 100 years, I think 96 years this year. And this credit reporting agency trust was very, very important for them. But this credit information agency also had a lot of big problems because many people simply didn't trust them. Maybe because they somehow didn't like credit information agencies or maybe because many people were afraid of it because a credit score, for example, can have great influence on their lives and it can even ruin their lives in case of doubt. And Schufa had even more problems because an expert consultant of the European Court of Justice found this year that the business model of Schufa, namely to evaluate us with very good scores, is perhaps even illegal. So we are now waiting for the ruling, which could mean that Schufa could no longer exist in Germany in this form. And that's when Schufa became very, very sad. And what do you do when you are sad? Well, I usually go shopping. So I go to H&M or an Apple store and I buy something way too expensive, totally useless. Schufa, they don't go to the Apple store. It's much bigger. 250 million euros annual revenue. You don't go to the Apple store, you buy startups. So Schufa went to the market and looked around to see what startups were available. And then they found a totally hip young modern company on the market called Bonify. And we were supposed to be running the commercial now for some reason as rendering. But anyway, it's a very, very hip company, modern Berlin office, 30 people, totally cool. And what does Bonify do? 
Bonify, Bonify is a totally serious and trustworthy company that takes care of you, your credit rating, your finances, and your future. They help you finally get your financial life under control. Bonify takes care of you. So a young hip startup that helps people with a great business model and that you should trust. And so Schufa thought, what a catch will buy them. And then Schufa just bought them at the end of last year. And wanted to use that to get rid of their black box image a bit so that you maybe trust them a bit more again. And all of that sounds great, but then I read this article and it says something about a data platform. I thought Bonify was there for you. And it's not about data, it's about your finances. So I just signed up. And then I see that, of course, the data platform, somehow they need my name, and my date of birth, and my cell phone number and my current address and all my last addresses and so on and so forth. The kind of stuff a data platform needs from you. And while you're at it, why don't you just give them access to your bank account so they can access your transactions? Because we trust them and they want to help us, so we should do that. And when we have done all of that, then they can help us really hard. Because then they can tell us something about our financial fitness. They can tell us our Schufa score and our Boniversum score. And I mean, you can see they want to help us with a credit rating. We just give them a little bit of data and they give us so much information. And if our Schufa score or Boniversum score is even uh, very bad, then they even have something for us. The kangaroo loan, only 15% APR maximum. <laughs> They're basically giving you free money, so to say. For those, yours, mine are bourgeois categories to quote the kangaroo here. And with that, you're just going to jump right over your financial bottleneck. And then there were these critics from the NDR uh, asset investigation group, and they came and tell people that this is super critical if Schufa sells credits, uh, sells loans free of charge with a subsidiary comp company of itself, of which the Schufa boss herself says those are basically loans and interview finance flows. But yeah, what about it? They shouldn't be so critical. So let's summarize the bonafide business model. You just give them your data. Super simple. And then they give you important information for your life. They've told you so far, thanks to Boniversum, whether you can get a loan or not, so um, how high your score is. Then they give you valuable tips about your financial freedom, which otherwise only your grandpa could give you, like, try saving more or your apartment is too expensive, well, it sucks if you live in Berlin. Or if you happen to need a loan, they also have something for you. Now, so far we've only mentioned Boniversum because they couldn't use Schufa as long as they didn't belong to Schufa yet. And that's why this was a strategic purchase, so to speak, for Bonify as well. So let's compare very briefly the difference between the two largest credit information providers in Germany, Boniversum versus Schufa, dual of the giants, so to speak. Boniversum is used by a few individual online stores in Germany. Schufa comes in automatically as soon as you open an account because they cooperate with all the banks. Schufa belongs to 30-ish different banks. Uh, maybe a few less, I don't know right now. With Boniversum, they get data from online stores and with Schufa from the banks. Both also use data from publicly available registers. That's also what I've done before, that it's great data from the insolvency register and the commercial, uh, commercial register. But when I did that, everyone got totally upset about it. They do it all the time. And then some of them try to figure out your credit score based on where you live, and the others use some more factors, like how many accounts you have, how many times you've moved, uh, whether you have loans, uh, and some more multi-factors. But you can read about all that. And what's really exciting is the turnover, because Boniversum internationally has a revenues of 575 million euros, but they're active worldwide, or at least in many countries. Schufa is only active in Germany, so they actually have a turnover of 250 million euros. 
Oh, oh. Uh, counter statement. Counter statement. Seven and a half years ago, in April 2016, Universum and Bonify were ready for revolution. Together, we want to ensure greater transparency when it comes to creditworthiness. Without Boniversum, Bonify would not exist as it does. It is important for us to clarify the following. The Boniversum score is one of the leading scores in the market. It is based on over 160 million data points for over 60 million people in Germany. Scores from different credit bureaus differ in terms of the data source the number of data, the influencing factors, scoring models, and the area of application, among other things. For example, the Boniversum score has a high relevance in e-commerce. Yes, I will always include counter statements on Bonify and individual points to keep things fair here. So they say the Boniversum score is still somehow important in Germany. Haven't figured out how yet. But yeah, let's get to the updated business models. So where the Schufa is bought Bonify. So now you can use Schufa with Bonify. A model where everybody profits and sharing your data is free. But now, since they got together, they wanted to expand their business model a little bit, because I think Bonify knows a lot about you, especially if you've shared data with them. And maybe Bonify should also share your data directly with Shufa, because if Shufa knows how much money you have in your account and when your salary comes and how long you've been working where and what porn sites you pay money for and you should pay for your porn, then they can tell you much better whether you are credit worthy or not. And Bonify, of course, being a good company with good terms and conditions, have already prepared everything so that they can share your credit data and your transactions with all kinds of companies if that's what it takes to launch services. So you're not just sharing with Bonify, but you're sharing your data directly with a lot of companies, the list of which is not yet complete at the time that you're sharing your data with, but you're also giving a lot back to you. And they know that your data is very, very sensitive. They recognize that on the basis of transaction data from your account, they can find out things like what your political opinion is, whether you're in a union, or how your health or your sex life is going. And I mean, it's all very sensitive, but they're safe. At least uh, that's what they say. Now you think, ah, oh, such a great philanthropic startup. <laughs> How do they actually make money in the last seven and a half years? Well, if we look at the balance sheet, they've never really made any money, but I mean, data wealth is something, even if it's not real wealth. They are venture funded, so investors put money into them in the hope that they will eventually become a very, very big startup. And there is a reference point that's Credit Karma from the US with the same weird business model. They were sold for, I think, 7 billion to Intuit. So seven and a half years ago, they saw a really big market in it. But Shufa is a very thrifty company. They would never pay 7 billion for a startup. They couldn't even do that with a balance sheet. That's why they bought it a bit cheaper for 20 million euros or so the story goes. And that was so little money that the employees who had an employee stock ownership program in Bonify got pretty much nothing except for a barbecue. So the Hip Bonify team must have been very sad. And if you follow the team website, I think some people left the company after the takeover. But I don't know that for sure. I just reconstruct that based on the team website. Right. And then a few months after the acquisition, Schufa announced very, very like, big on the website that now Bonify also has the Schufa score that we just talked about. And that's the revolution in the credit rating market, because now you can quickly check your credit rating online at Bonify for free and at the same time share a bit of data and in the future even share more data to Schufa since they've hustled quite hard in six months afterwards to implement the feature. Everybody says revolution. I don't quite agree because you can call up your credit rating from Schufa free of charge for quite a few years now using the free data copy. And then you don't get just your basics on an app, but you get a thick stack of paper sent to your home with all the data that Schufa has about you. So this app feature, maybe not all that revolutionary, but it was enough for the newspaper. 
As of today, the Shufa revolution is in effect, and they really took off at this press conference. And after that, the Bonify app was number two in the App Store. <coughs> but the app actually didn't even have the Shufa score integrated at that point. So they sort of pushed the app as part of the press conference and said, yeah, we have all the features now, everything is going to be great. All over the news, people are downloading this app, and then they still cannot find the Shufa score because app updates always take a few weeks longer, as you may know. So that happened on July 18th, and on July 22nd, Friday afternoon, you know how it is, you wake up in Berlin from the hard week of capitalism, and you think to yourself, shit, I've already spent 50 hours in front of the computer this week, 20 more to go, so what happened in Germany this week? Oh, something from Bonify. Got to take a look at that. So I sign up there, and I give them all my data, and I see, oh. Bank ID process. We've had really good experiences with that. Bank ID, that's this thing where you log in and you give them access to your account. And on the one hand, you give them your transaction data, but they also get a name in which the account is held. And with the name in which the account is held, they try to identify you because your bank has identified you at some point according to the Anti-Money Laundering Act. So you do a kind of chain identification. Your bank says you're the person because your bank has checked this at some point, so you probably are this person. And that's a procedure that's always used as an alternative to showing your ID card online in some form, but hasn't been very successful so far. So I think, for example, you cannot open an account anywhere with it because there were concerns from Bafin, the regulators, and maybe it's not the most secure procedure. Let's take a detailed look at how it works. There are, in the whole thing, three parties, namely Bonify itself, then Finlib Connect, Finlib Connect GmbH and your bank. And at Bonify, you enter your first and last name in a small window, and they show you an iframe on the website. And there you say, which bank are you using, and your account number, and your password into this iframe, because sure, that's, that's what you're supposed to do, right? And then what they do is they log in via your bank's API and different variations, and they retrieve some data. For example, the name, the IBAN, the transaction list, and so on and so forth. You can't really tell what they retrieve, but you just assume that it's everything they can get. And then they mint a JWT token that you can that you can use to retrieve the data, and they redirect you back to Bonafide. Bonafide, then they take the first name you entered in the field earlier and compare that to the first name that your account is on by checking to see if one string is another string or vice versa. So if you enter any number of names in the field, for example, I would write Lilith Jens, and that's my last name, Wittmann Spahn, then my account is verified. And at this point, the lecture could actually be over. <laughs> I don't know who came up with that. Maybe someone had a name like that and was looking for a way to verify it properly. But yeah, anyway, I put that in there, it went through, then I had this account with Lilith against Spahn. I considered stopping there, but then I thought, okay, that was five minutes. I have another half hour left. Next time I log in, I'm going to open up my developer console. So now we're going to become really bad as hackers. <laughs> and we'll take a look at the requests that the Bonifair website is making to the server or to the microservice in the background. So first we enter this name, and then our name is sent by mail to an API endpoint called user management prod slash user, and then with that the user object is created. And then we do this whole identification process with the iframe, and we log in to our bank and we release the data. And then there is another form where we enter the rest of our data so that they have more data about us. And then we call up the same API endpoint again and store more data. Now, that would be a very blatant hack if the second time we called up this endpoint, we simply sent along some additional first and last names. That would be pretty stupid if you forgot how APIs work and had to think about what a security concept could be. Well, and then I already had the credit report for Jens Spahn. So 
And Bonify still has many more great value-added services, well, not so many, but at least one, and that is the renter information. So after you've gone through this registration process of Bonify, you can give them 20 euros and they give you a PDF. Uh, I think that's a really fair deal because it's a, a PDF that you can trust. It doesn't have a signature or anything, but um, there is a code on it and you can enter it on a website and then they will tell you if the PDF is real, that is uh, part of the data is real. It's not the worst process I've ever seen to verify PDFs because you could also do it with a blockchain. So anyway, then um, I had Jens Spahn's rental information and here you can see how I validated. We can take a quick look at that. Right, so there is this, this number here. So we copy that and then we go to the uh, Bonify website and just enter it there. And then it says my rent. Now you all know how much rent I pay. Ah, oh, no, it doesn't say that. Very good. I took the right version. No, it... right. But then you could, if you wanted to, for maybe your friends who maybe don't have such a high rent or don't have such a high salary, simply issue your rental information for them on which the salary of the account is also found by AI. So they take the transactions from the account that you gave them and then they try to figure out what the salary payment is and what the rent payment is and write it on there. So it was a good trick to kind of help your friends. My dashboard always looked like that, unfortunately. I only had access to the Boniversum score and this rental report, but not the Schufa report. And that really took me a little time to really figure out what's happening here because actually, I actually log into them then the, the first time a pop-up like this comes up and they ask you if they may share your data with Shufa. And then I thought that's when they would send your data to Shufa for the first time. And then they return the score. And if I had manipulated all of that before, then I would just get the Shufa score from another person. Counter statement. It is noted that we contradict our own terms and conditions by sending a score before consent. This is not true. The score is transmitted only after explicit consent. A data exchange for identification takes place beforehand. This is listed in Bonify's privacy policy. It's limited exclusively to data for identification in order to be sure that the score is only played out to the person for whom it belongs. This is how the manipulated personal data was detected by Yes. So, reading terms and conditions always helps. Let's learn from that. Yeah, I mixed that up because everything had to go pretty fast. It was Saturday morning and I really didn't feel like it. Um, but yeah, it's simply contained in the terms and conditions that what they do is after you've carried out the account identification process, they take your name, your account number, they send it to Shufa and then Shufa has a product called something like account number check or Jira ident or something like that. And they look in their database to see if there's anyone with your name and account number. And then they return the name, address, and account number and want to make this account ID procedure even more AML compliant. This is actually a product you can buy from Shufa. I wasn't aware of that up to that point, but since the name didn't match the account number, I couldn't call it the Shufa score, which was a bit of a shame, but I think it was still pretty cool. And now we come to the really important question in this whole story. Because I found that out and now what do I do with it? There are basically two options. Well, maybe there are a few more. We want to talk about two of them today. One is to do a responsible disclosure. That means a lot of work for me. I have to write a document, explain it to the company what the problem is. Then I send it to them. At some point, they read it, maybe close the gap, let me know. In the meantime, I look for journalists to publish together with them. And at the end, I publish the vulnerability after it has been closed. And the company sometimes also publishes something, a counter statement, and then it's done. Now, contrast that with shitposting. In that, I take the security hole that's still open, I write a tweet that's as provocative as possible and tweet it. Then I wait for as many journalists as possible to write to me in a short amount of time. We're really keen to make this story really big. And because it's already on Twitter, they no longer have to consult with their legal advisors, which means they can also issue a press release relatively quickly, which sometimes is quite advantageous. So to make this decision, let's take a quick look at why I do civil society security research. 
And right at the top of my list for me is actually protecting your data. But also, I want to make life really, really difficult for companies with a stupid business model that I personally think kind of sucks. And as you maybe know, I also love to interact with the state. And of course, on a political level, I would like to somehow stop stupid digitization projects and to facilitate data that should be public from the state. And I'm also happy if you guys have fun doing that. And of course, I myself also often have fun doing it. Reasons why I don't do it, I don't want to help companies become more secure. So that's a side effect, it happens, but it's not my goal to tell the company so that they're more secure afterwards. So that your data is more secure is important to me, but not that the company is better off afterwards. And I'm not trying to make money off of it. I tried that once this year with one of these bug bounty programs at a big online mail order company where I found a really funny loophole that I would love to talk about. But I thought, I'm doing this through responsible disclosure, I'm doing this through bug bounty program, and they've banned me from talking about it. That frustrates me a lot, and I don't think I'll ever do that again in the future. <coughs> Back to our question, responsible disclosure or shitposting. Let's maybe take a quick look at the what ifs. If responsible disclosure, they would leave the application online, the vulnerability would be closed, and a well-prepared PR people who might be sitting in the audience now would then communicate about the vulnerability, probably better than I could, and there would be no reputation loss for Schufa. And a good example, and I hope the video works this time, is when Finanzwende, an NGO, tried handing Schufa a signature list with 300,000 signatures the other day on exactly this issue, namely this account retriever, Schufa received them, had the umbrellas for them, made a funny image movie out of it. And this is what happens when you try to expose communication professionals. Most of the time you don't even need to try, so I didn't think that was necessarily a good strategy. So, what could have happened in any case, nobody notices, Schufa continues to have a good PR run, continues to be number two in the App Store, Schufa would have exploited responsible disclosure to continue to position itself well, and I would have wasted a weekend. Now, we, before we return to the dark side, one thing we need to look at is whether I committed a crime on the hack list. Because if I had done that, then responsible disclosure could be interpreted positively to me. It would still be a criminal offense because we still have a hacker paragraph in Germany that still prohibits civil society or security research. We can just check that in the case because they only use public APIs in the case. I didn't have to somehow overcome access barriers that I shouldn't have overcome. And as we know, thanks to the CEU versus the Littmann reference case, as long as you use public APIs, it's not a criminal offense. That's kind of straftat. At least, as a disclaimer, this is not a court judgment, but it's a very um, media-rich reference in the Berlin Public Prosecutor's Office that took care of very quickly at the time. And I know I'm super privileged to be able to talk about it like this because I have the possibilities that if I end up being sued, I probably get out of it okay. Not everybody can say that now, probably, but I mean, in this case, it's quite practical, and that's why we're calling it now, we're shitposting this. Okay, no wait. We'll take another quick look at what the worst case scenario is, whether something bad could happen. And I think the worst thing we could do with the gap would be to call up a credit report for other people, which may not be yourself, but you leave your, your account number, so to speak, your identity card, that it was you. So in other words, if you were to do this with bad intentions, hadn't asked the person beforehand, and it's not yet spun, then that would probably be noticed and the person would get into trouble. Then landlords could get fake credit reports, and I thought, oh, poor landlords. <laughs> <laughs> and people could have found more vulnerabilities, which is actually kind of the most critical, because I mean, if there's one vulnerability and I found it out, and somebody could maybe find more quickly. But I thought they're a big enough company that they shut it down quickly after they published the vulnerability, and it means because of that, the risk is manageable. So there's a potentially big reputational loss, but for the company, just for the company, but the vulnerability, the problem for individuals is very manageable. So we should post it. And just a few hours later, we saw the status monitoring at Bonify 
turned red, they were down, and very quickly in my signal inbox, I had a contact request from the NDR, as said, Research Corporation, Nils Bischmeier, Peter Hornung, and they also published a really great report in the Tagesschau and in the SZ then. Um, exclusively. And we got very lucky because the very coolest thing that can happen to you in such a case is to land on the DPA distribution list. So if you end up on the distribution list, then the chances are very high that many small daily newspapers will report on you the next day. And that's why you should always try to get on DPA distribution list somehow with such uh, vulnerabilities. So what happened, Schufa and Boniversum cut the data connection to Bonify less than 24 hours later. Oh, uh, Bonify, sorry. Um, und, uh, Bonify is for two weeks completely and Bonify went completely offline for two weeks, and the apps are still not in the App Store today. <laughs> And the ladies and gentlemen from the crisis PR made a splendid fool of themselves, lied to journalists from my perspective, they spent an immense reputational blow to Schufa. And remember, first they were going up in the build elevator, and if there is one rule, that is what goes up with the build elevator, it also goes down with the build elevator at some point. And this was the build homepage for two days. Counter statement. An activist manipulated names and address data as part of the registration process for the account identification procedure. In the process, user accounts were created for politicians and to journalists, among others. One of these editors even confirmed in an article in the Süddeutsche Zeitung that the hacker had manipulated names and addresses for the Süddeutsche Zeitung and the NDR. Quote, Lilith Wittmann was able to prove in several independent tests for NDR and Süddeutsche Zeitung that there is a kind of entry point in the app to get manipulated credit reports on the Boniversum Credit Bureau, end quote. So what you have to say at this point is that it's quite normal that you work with journalists, that of course they want to see the vulnerability if they're going to write about it. And that's why it's not that I manipulated anything on behalf of anyone, I simply recreated this vulnerability for journalists. But you can see here what kind of framing they tried, namely that it's now the evil journalists who have commissioned me to manipulate something. And this framing then continues, because a few days later, a new item appears at the bottom of the homepage, responsible disclosure. <laughs> but they didn't even write a responsible disclosure guideline themselves, they just took the one from Fusion off, threw that into Google Translate, and it is still very embarrassing to read even today. And I noticed that very early on, I tweeted that before they could put anything out in the press about it, I think. So this way I've always already set a counter position and so they could no longer get very much out of it. But at least they still wrote what we cannot understand. Typically, attackers report their findings to the company whose program, website or app is affected. This gives the companies a reasonable amount of time to close the vulnerability. This is not the case for us, particularly bitter for us. The joint development team of Schufa and Bonify had already been in contact with the activists for several weeks to get her to cooperate. <laughs> So I wasn't very nice, but I keep it with Bad Moms J here. Um, so tell me what happens with women in business when they're, net, when they're too nice. A uh, very cool rapper. I think if I was nice to all the companies, then nothing cool would ever happen. And so I took a look at my LinkedIn messages, and sure enough, Hello, Frau Wittmann. My name is Hello, Ms. Wittmann. My name is Mm, and I work for Schufa. I am currently putting together a team to implement free digital access to your own data at Schufa. The aim is to answer how this data is used and how it works in expansion stages, also how it can be influenced, deleted, and controlled. So they want to build data cockpits where you can put more data into so that Schufa can then score you better, so that you're basically commissioning Schufa to score you. I'm looking for an experienced team lead to build the underlying application and technical infrastructure to get super sensitive personal data securely into an app, iOS and Android. Here at Schufa, the topic is even more sensitive and associated with a higher risk of misuse. Internally, the necessary expertise does not exist. That's why I'm desperately looking for external help, not the best company for it. 
Obviously. Obviously. Currently, however, I am far behind schedule in terms of team infrastructure and competencies. Nothing helps plan transparency less than if we were to screw up the setup and in the end the overdue implementation doesn't get off the ground, either because of a one-star reviews in the app stores, poorly implemented, not understandable, or where is no confidence in access and integrity of the data contained within. They actually had both issues. But hey, you have a say, somehow one competent person got confused enough to get uh, to Shufa, and then nobody listened to them. I mean, you all know that. And I mean, it's uh, quite clear who wants to work for Shufa. I mean, as a working class kid, I somehow learned you have to be afraid of Shufa. Maybe if you have rich parents and they're landlords, then you may think Shufa is great. But I'm not going to work for anyone I'm, I'm afraid of. And I mean, if you can read my LinkedIn profile, it literally says not to ask me about IT security related stuff. Because professionally, I prefer to do nice things. And just because some company offers me a crap job doesn't mean I'm going to look at them. Because if I stop looking at every company that was once my LinkedIn inbox, I mean... But yeah, let's move on to another topic, which is the intriguing question of why exactly did Trufa buy Bonify? Was it really just that they were in a bad place and wanted to go shopping? Or did they perhaps have an ulterior motive here? That now the speculative part of the talk, where I don't have that much evidence for, but I'm just going to speculate on it anyway. So. As we recall, Schufa scoring is probably violating EU law, which sucks for Schufa because it's a business model. And now there's something completely new and hip, namely self-determined self -determined digital identities, which unfortunately you've probably all heard about before uh, with blockchains. So what you do is you get digital credentials from various institutions, like a digital ID, digital driver's license, digital credit card, digital credentials. And maybe in the future, a digital credit report that you can buy, and then you put those in your wallet, on your phone. And then you can share that digital credit report to other places or show it to them and it's guaranteed genuine. And to do that, you put a digital certificate on your phone that's either rooted in a PKI or rooted in a blockchain, it doesn't really matter. Both suck. And then you take these digital certificates and you just push them into your phone memory. And when you show them, you take a digital copy of that digital certificate, you send that to the other institution, and the other institution then takes that digital proof and verifies it against other PKI or a blockchain. So, if we compare it to the offline world, if you normally would show an ID somewhere, for example, if you stand at a door, you show the ID, and then the doorman doesn't let you in because you're in my talk, nobody's going to let you in. If you do this online, uh, now in terms of the offline world, there would be a doorman standing there again, he would ask you, please give me your ID, he would take your ID, give it to the notary standing next to him. This notary would make a certified copy of this document, put it on file, and then you don't know what's going to happen with this copy of the document. And then the doorman doesn't let you in again, of course. So, what you're sort of doing is you're distributing your documents to lots and lots of places, and one or two of these places may eventually burn down or get their data stolen, and then lots and lots of people are going to have guaranteed real documents about you. Data richness. With verifiable credentials or other such digital credentials, I can decide who I give my data to, but I cannot control what happens to it afterwards. And what's really funny is that you store these things in your cell phone. They're guaranteed to be real and they're guaranteed to have been issued to you and only you. From the moment they're on your phone, you become responsible for them. So when the next WhatsApp scam comes around the car and asks you to upload your ID because your daughter needs your ID urgently, then you are responsible for having uploaded it. 
or you simply have an old cell phone and there's malware on it. So we have a new trend that is totally hip and that especially the last federal government found superb, which is why they built a whole ecosystem around this trend. There's a wide variety of projects with dozens of companies involved and the Chancellor's Office even built apps itself. In total, the last federal government invested 215 million euros in digital credentials and also built their own wallet app, which uh, somehow ended up being released on the 20th of September, just before the last federal election, which I think was on 26th. Flipke and I looked at it at the time. And by the time of the federal election, it was already no longer online because it also had a little problem which we posted about, namely you could pretend to be any person or any institution and just query your digital credentials. So I could be the police or I could be Helge Braun, the head of the chancellor's office at the time. And we still don't have that app today. The federal chancellor or the federal ministry of the interior they discontinued all of this and they're now thinking about a solution that is no longer so blatantly wallet-based and that will perhaps be a bit better than what we had back then, but I think it will also unfortunately still be really bad. The Chancellor's Office or the Responsible Head of Department is not so happy about it there, but if you want to read the whole story, it's in my blog. Yeah, and these digital credentials, you ask yourselves, what does this have to do with Shufa and Bonify and all of that shit? Well, Boniversum is participating in all of these projects. Schufa not yet, Boniversum. And they are members of the ID Union project. The aim of the ID Union project is to somehow get different digital proofs into a wallet app. And one of things that at least the original plan is, I understand, and it's not really officially announced anywhere, but they were going to make credit certificates based on digital credentials, saying you earn so so much and uh, so there, there are no negative entries anywhere. Which, of course, means that in the event that the Schufa scoring model fails, they would have a cool alternative right away. Because instead of Schufa scoring you and having any data about you, your landlord wants you to go to a scoring partner, which you give all your data to, and then you issue yourself a digital certificate, which you can then give to lots of different places. And in the best case scenario, you also pay for it. Because already today you pay 20 euros for a signed PDF, and then if it's a bit more machine readable, I would say that's worth 50 euros easily. And the thing is, you can actually also do this wonderfully for banks. So the Sparkasse can sell you digital signed accounts statement if you like, and that's why they have to be quick if they still want to be part of this business model. And I think that's actually the real reason, that's the direction they want to go with the business model. Um, but like I said, I don't have any evidence for this. It's just there's a lot of things that point to this because they need an alternative and the alternative would obviously lend itself. So as we are almost at the end of our time, we come to our summary. As always, we should use public data and protect private data, and that is true in 99% of cases. And then please do responsible disclosure if you want to know how to do it. There's a presentation by Zerforschung that explains a little bit uh, also how companies should deal with the reports, and there's more than enough material otherwise. But there are also exceptions. If the advantages of such a hack far outweigh the disadvantages in the public perception, and we don't put any groups of people or individuals significantly at risk, then I think it's legitimate to not work according to responsible disclosure, especially talking about shitty companies that we kind of a social consensus about uh, not wanting to have them anymore unless you're a landlord. And in all, all, all other cases, please continue to do responsible disclosure. And I know if you don't, don't not do it the first time you find a security breach, find a vulnerability, talk to people who know about it before you do it, don't do it lightly. But there are cases where it can make sense, but also very few. And at this point, there's another hint, work together with other organizations, if there are others in the field already. In the case, for example, of Schufa, we have the Finanzwende, made this big signature campaign, 
very committed to ensuring that Shufa account access doesn't come and you can continue to sign their petition. So please do that. But especially if you as a hacker are not an expert in the respective field, it's very good to look for an organization that you can push in the media. In this case, I'm almost a bit annoyed uh, that I didn't do that, but I thought maybe I took the circuit back in. I didn't know how long I had to post it before they shut it down and that would have been a bit silly. Right, but sign this petition. And what I've kind of learned from it myself is again, Shufa, they're first and foremost an incompetent bunch. I don't need to be afraid of them and we have to get rid of them. Shufa has to die so that we may live. And with that, we've come to the end. You can contact me at this URL. Um, unfortunately, there will not be a Q&A as we announced in the beginning. In case you have a formal delivery for me, you don't find the address there, just do it via Chaos Post. Otherwise, you find digital contact options there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lilith. Like I said, no Q&A. If you still want to stay, meet up with Lilith somewhere here on the side, please. When you leave the hall, the tent, please keep the way clear. If you want to chat, take care of yourselves, drink enough water. And if you drink alcohol, drink even more water. And yeah, generally drink more water. Have a good evening. Ciao.